Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, oh, good. Hello. So, uh, hi, I'm Harper. Um, Niklas emailed me and said, hey, do you want to speak again? And I said, yes, of course, because this is my social media strategy. I get here, I put my Twitter handle up there, and I say, follow me. Um, but really, I put this up here because if there's any questions or if you want to engage afterwards, I'm always interested in meeting you people and engaging. Um, thank you for having me. Um, I'm very excited to be here in Sweden because I heard that Swedish people like really big shirts, so I had a really big shirt. <laughs> Is this true? No? Everyone's shaking their head and nodding. I'm very confused. Um, so today, I'm going to talk a little bit about AI and unintended consequences. This is one of my favorite topics to talk about. I think it's very, very important. But before I get into that, I'm going to talk about the absolute, my absolutely favorite topic in the entire world, myself. How many people like that topic? Okay, good. Well, you're in the right place. So, how, has anyone, does anyone know these folks? Okay, so the, uh, for those who don't, that's Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak and some other guy. Um, and then this is the Apple IIc. That was the first computer I had as a young person. Did anyone have an Apple computer? Okay, anyone have a Commodore? Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> has anyone read this book, Hackers? No? Okay, this is a great book. If you're interested in kind of, I think, how we got where we got with the internet, with technology, with engineering, this is a great book to read. It talks a lot about all these ideas of sharing, openness, collaboration. I actually don't know what hands-on imperative is. I just copied this from Wikipedia. But it, it means something apparently important. And after reading this book, I realized that I am a hacker, and that is really my core identity. Um, but for the most part, I'm a coder. Does anyone here program computers? Okay, good. It's fun, right? Wait, how many people here use Excel? OK, so you're all programmers. Um, early in my career, I, I joined this company called Threadless. And Threadless is really fun. Does anyone here remember Threadless? The interesting thing about Threadless is that we accidentally invented crowdsourcing. And I say accidentally because we had no idea. We went to this conference at MIT much like this. And when they introduced us to get on stage, they said, here's Threadless. They invented crowdsourcing. And we were like, crowd what? What do you mean, crowdsourcing? Because for us, we were trying to take this and turn it into that. A very simple kind of experience. And of course, we used the crowd, which was really important, four simple steps, design. People like y'all would design a really great t-shirt. You would submit it to Threadless. Then the audience would score it. And then cash money would fall into our pockets. Mostly us, a little bit yours. It worked out pretty well. And around uh, some time la later, I, I decided that, I'd, that I uh, had accomplished all of my goals, everything I wanted to do. So I did the one thing that I think we should all do today, which is I quit my job. Who's with me? <laughs> OK. There was like one person that raised their hand and then quickly put it down. <laughs> I wonder if their boss was near or something. I don't know. Um, and I went on a vision quest. Does anyone know what a vision quest is? OK, there's two or three people who obviously know very intimately that raise their hand very quickly. So Vision Quest is this uniquely North American idea of where you go into the desert um, and maybe do some drugs and find a spirit animal. Um, I did not do that. I joined a VC firm, which I think is similar. Um, and, and my goal was to really find where I was going. I needed to know, how do you build a big company? How do you build these things? Um, and luckily, um, I was kind of interrupted in my journey um, by this guy to join, join that organization. Um, this guy is Michael Slaby. Um, if you woke him up at 3 AM, he would be dressed like this. <laughs> he was a CTO in 2008 for the Ob Barack Obama campaign. Um, here's my official campaign photo. There's a little difference there. <laughs> I was a CTO in 2012. I always like to joke that if you had the next photo of the set, It'd be a homeless person. Um, anyway, um, so why me? This is the question that is always asked. And the first person to ask this question was my mother. I tell her, oh, I got this crazy new job. And she's like, why you? And I was just like, come on, mom. Well, to really get into it, though, you really have to know the difference between 2008 and 2012. In 2008, the Obama campaign was a startup. How many people here have been in a startup? OK, so startups are terrible. They totally suck. The main reason why they suck is because you just don't know if it's going to last. We are, as humans, I think we like things to last longer than a few weeks. And that's scary, and, but it's also fun. And that's why I love startups. But that was the campaign in 2008. In 2012, we were the enterprise. How many people here work in an enterprise? OK, 
Good. So the enterprise, the interesting thing about enterprise is we knew we were going to raise billions of dollars. We knew all of this stuff. So we knew that we really had to engage in solid engineering. And this was a really big deal. We had about you know, 40 engineers. Um, many of them came from these really good, big, important companies. That's obviously the most important company. Um, we had about 120 tech staff total on my team, which was 10 times the amount of tech staff we had in 2008. We started from absolutely zero. Um, and it took about 18 months, so really we focused on one thing and one thing only, and that's execution. Um, and that's really important. Um, and here's a cake that, um, yeah. To be honest, I don't know why I accidentally censored it. <laughs> I think it's really funny. As soon as I saw this, I was like, oh boy, this must be the slide for children. Um, but anyway, this is a cake that one of our DevOps people made. It was really funny. They bring this cake and they set it on a table and we all look at it and we're like, we, if we eat this cake, we might fuck it up. We can't eat this cake. So we just set the cake there and let it there for like two weeks until election day happened and then we ate the cake. So anyway, we built this thing called Narwhal. It was this platform, this really big platform. And, and so this is my boss photoshopped as a narwhal. Here he is as Harry Potter. Here he is as a giraffe. This is my favorite one. I actually made little buttons and passed them out of him as a giraffe. Here he is as a dragon. The campaign was really stressful. How many people here have a really stressful job? Okay, so you know how it just, it just feels like there's just a lot of pressure, it's really hard. So I would do things like make these Photoshops, well, I, I had, a friend would make them. And then right here would be a, a thought bubble, and it would just say like questions. And that would be the last slide of my presentation. And I would always put that up there as the last slide, you know, this draft or, or the dragon. And then I'd say questions, and then someone would raise their hand, and they, I'd be like, yes, and they'd be like, what's wrong with you? So anyway, there's this idea of narwhal, this giant concept that if we created an API as a foundation for everything we did, we could have the freedom to really focus on all these important products that we needed to win the election. Things like call tool, dashboard, all these very big things. But the biggest thing, I think, the, most, uh, the thing that has lasted was our data. We had a huge innovation for, uh, around the data usage. We used data for absolutely everything. Um, and election day, as you can imagine, was pretty chill. This is a sticky note from right in the front. Um, and luckily, we won, or I wouldn't be here. Um, and after that, it was this really exciting time. I went on another vision quest. This time, I did not, once again, do drugs or go to the desert. Instead, I started a company. We called the company Modest because we like to name things after ourselves. Um, we had a very simple goal. For the last 15 years, I realized that we had been building the back end of commerce. We've been building software for warehouses, software for payments. We never talked to the user, the customer. And so we decided, how, how do we change that a little bit? How do we focus on that user? And how do we build something that is actually really exciting, something that's better, quicker, friendlier, but most importantly, mobile, this commerce experience. And that's what we did. Um, and it was really fun. Um, and I figured out a really good cheat code for startups. Um, for those of you who are on a startup, this is a really good way to scale your startup, is to sell it to PayPal. Very easy. Um, and we relaunched uh, that as PayPal Commerce a few years ago. And so now, I'm on another vision quest. I have no idea what I'm doing. Seriously, please save me. Those of you who quit your job earlier in the talk, we'll meet in the back and start a company. How about? So, let's go back in time. Um, I love history. Um, and so let's go far, far, far back in time to 2014. It was a wonderful time, right? Look at this. Here I am. This is my first time in Sweden. I was so excited. Life was great. Obama was still president. Everything was beautiful. So my presentation that I gave, it was this presentation. The intro was very similar because, you know, that's how intros are. Um, and it was pretty straightforward. I talked a lot about the innovations that we had I'm going into a lot more detail. Um, here's, here's, a, here's a quick glimpse of some of the stuff I said. So I talked about the media. The media loved Obama data. Obama campaign data, if you did a Google search around then, this is what it said. Obama can't, actually, that's kind of boring. Let's make it exciting. Obama campaign micro-targeting. <laughs> I have no idea what that means. But I also love this, this picture. <laughs> I, think, I, I think about this picture a lot. Like, are there a lot of cats on boats? I don't spend a lot of time on boats. I have so many questions. So what this shows is that micro-targeting is really, really exciting. 
So when I did this presentation in 2014, that's basically what I said. And then I went to this next slide, and I thought it was really interesting then, and I think it's really interesting now, but for different reasons. Um, so this next slide shows our login um, kind of dialogue. Um, and the thing that you might not be able to see is we ask for everything, every single piece of data that we could get from Facebook. And we tested this really extensively, and, and it, we found that just no one cared. If we asked for just the name, it, we, we got as many people to log in as if we asked for every single piece of data we got. And in the 2014 presentation, I talked about how we use this, how we use this to send emails like this. Um, this is an email sent to me. John Ruth right there is a very good friend of mine. Um, and so we were able to use the Facebook data to determine who my best friend was and then send me an email to get them to activate. In 2014, this was amazing. This is one of the most exciting pieces of technology that we built. But now, things are a little different. We have headlines like this. The work we did in 2012, this work that we were really proud of had been weaponized. We did not intend this whatsoever to happen. We did not intend this to be the result. Because our intention was to, be, to clearly do the right thing, to do the thing that we thought was important. And this was an innovation and an invention that was rooted in hope, in we were trying to get this guy elected. Except we were not careful. We released this idea, and of course, it was going to happen eventually anyway. But we kind of released it and just said, here, check this out. We did all this really neat stuff with Facebook data. We were not careful. I think it's important to be careful. Because the unintended consequences of our inventions of hope will turn against us. And I think we're at this very interesting point where all of this neat technology that we're building is only going to make things worse. And we're entering this new realm. And I don't know what's going to happen, but it is up to us. So let's talk about that a little bit. Let's talk about AI. I think that's the important, important direction that we need to, to go. So first, what is AI? Does anyone know? Seriously, I have no idea. <laughs> Please help. <laughs> All I know is that AI is magic. Does anyone agree? Not very many people agree it's magic. Well, here, let me show you. So the first part about AI to remember is AI is really simple, right? It's just machine learning and neural networks, right? Which is just math. And the thing about math or, or the thing about these things is it's absolutely not new. Both of these things were, were, are about 50 years old, which is pretty exciting. So we have progress now. Um, and one of the things that we're noticing is it's getting way better, right? It's getting way faster. My favorite part, it's getting way, way weirder. So let's look at this picture. I love this photo. What a great photo. OK, ready? Look at my beard. <laughs> I could do that all day. When I first showed this to my partner, Hiromi, over there, she was like, why is there a dog in your beard? <laughs> it's a great question. Why is there a dog in my beard? Anyway, AI is used every day. It's becoming the standard tool. It's becoming the tool, the foundation. Many of our companies are building. Many companies are betting on this. And they're betting on it because it is a sure bet. But there's a couple of interesting things about AI that I think is worth talking about. The first one is that AI does not learn like humans. I love this. Did anyone see this Go match? Lisa it all. Did anyone see this? It was amazing. But the best part about it was all of the Go pundits I didn't know where there were Go pundits until this happened and they all talked, but apparently there are Go pundits. All the Go pundits, they were saying, oh, the AlphaGo machine, the computer, is losing. Look at these crazy moves it's making. It's never going to win. And then the, the computer made like a couple final moves and they were like, oh. And Lee Sedol said, oh. And then Lee Sedol got the pants beat off him. Because the AI had created this alien knowledge. It was moves that no one had ever seen. It was knowledge that no one had ever seen. And it's not just this. A lot of times it manifests like this. Google doesn't quite understand what Rank Brain is doing. So Google has an algorithm called Rank Brain, ostensibly. They don't understand what it does. This is weird. This is also from 2016. So here's an interesting thing. I have a Tesla. I love getting on the highway. Does anyone here have a Tesla? There has to be at least one person. OK, so no one will admit it. Um, but I have a Tesla, you get on the highway, you turn on auto driving, and the first thing I think is, Tesla doesn't know why this works. <laughs> and I just love that. There's this guy, James Bridle, James Bridle's amazing. James Bridle, um, he, he says, machine learning is what we call any software we don't understand. 
There's this other part, which is very smart people are super scared of AI. So you have Bill Gates, reasonable guy. I don't understand why, people, why some people are not concerned. Elon Musk, maybe less reasonable. With artificial intelligence, we are summoning the demon. Stephen Hawking, the development of full artificial intelligence could spell the end of the human race. Why? Well, I think there's a couple of thought experiments we have to go through. The first one is the paperclip maximizer. Has anyone heard of this? Okay, so this is my favorite thing, but I also find it really hard to explain, so bear with me. So you have a paperclip factory, um, and we decide to upgrade it to be fully autonomous. We're going to make a boatload of paperclips. And so we, uh, we, we make this factory, making it's, it's, it's autonomous, it's just shooting paper clips out. So many paper clips, we're now very wealthy, and we decide we're going to go on vacation. So we go on vacation, and the paper clip factory is kind of left alone to make paper clips. But it happens to run out of paper clip material. And we're just like, whatever, we're on vacation, we're enjoying the beach or whatever we go for vacation. And the factory is just like, well, I need more material. So it sends a little robot out, and it grabs a tree, grabs a car, grabs some houses, grabs a neighborhood, grabs a city grabs a country, suddenly grabs the world, the planets, just to make paper clips. It's this idea that unchecked, a, an autonomous being that is just made to made paper clips might harvest everything. And this is a hard problem to solve because it really is about constraint and AI, and that's, com that's complicated. Another one that's really fun is the, the AI control problem. Has anyone heard of this one? This is, this is actually my favorite. The power button problem is probably a good way to call it. Um, how many people here have a Roomba? Okay, a few people. So you, you all know Roombas. So you have a, let's, this is the example. You, imagine you have a Roomba, and it's in your house cleaning, and you get an email from the company, and it's like, we have upgraded your Roomba. It is fully autonomous. Your house will now be very clean. And you're just like, oh, great. It was, you know, it was like 80% clean. Now I want it to be 100%. This is perfect. So you're, you're watching the Roomba. It is just clean. Your house is, is so clean, it's awkward. It's great. You're loving it. And the Roomba's great. And then once again, you're going to go on vacation. And so you're like, yo, Roomba. I'm going to go on vacation, and the Roomba's like, okay, I'll clean the house. And you're like, meh, I think you should stop while I'm on vacation. It just doesn't seem to make sense. And the Roomba's like, nah, I'm going to clean your house. And you're like, Roomba, I'm going to go on vacation, so maybe just let's don't clean. And the Roomba's like, no, I'm going to clean your house. Because the Roomba's supposed to, that's what it does. It cleans your house. And so you realize you're in an argument with a vacuum. And you go and you grab a broom, and you're, you're going to, like, turn it off the Roomba. Because it scoots away every time you go. And you go and it's turned off, and the Roomba kills you and your family and harvests everyone and cleans the house. So, I think that's basically what this is supposed to be about. But it's this idea that it's really hard because you're going to kill it when you turn it off. It's going to cease to function. It's going to cease to exist. But more importantly, it's not going to be able to clean. These are some big philosophical questions, but luckily, philosophers are working. And they're trying to solve these problems at universities all around the world. But what about today? Today, I think there's some really big things. There's, but, but we have a long way to go before we have killer robots. Some of my favorite parts about kind of some of the innovations around AI, um, this is one of my favorite things, robots falling. If you go to YouTube and just type in robots falling, you get a lot of good stuff. Don't let the Roomba watch you watch these videos. <laughs> um, another one is training AI. Has anyone here trained AIs or models? So this is a fun one. My favorite thing about training AI is that sometimes you get to document some very strange things. So here's, here's one. Um, an agent, this kind of AI, pauses a game indefinitely to avoid losing. Sounds like me when I was a child. Um, an agent kills itself at the end of level one to avoid losing in level two. <laughs> Creatures bred for speed grow really tall and generate high velocities by falling over. This is my favorite one. Simulated pancake-making robot learned to throw the pancake as high in the air as possible in order to maximize time away from ground. <laughs> I need to make more pancakes. Um, there's so many more of these, and you can go check them out at this URL. Um, and it just shows that models can be crazy. There's some fun stuff. Um, and digital assistants are really fun. Does anyone here have a Google Home or, or, Go or an Alexa? I guess it's not a Google Alexa, but an Alexa. Um, here's, here's a headline from Alexa. Amazon Alexa started ordering people dollhouses after hearing its name on TV. Parrot activates Alexa when mimicking owners places online shopping order. <laughs> I'm not sure if this is anti-Parrot or anti-Alexa. That seems like a lot of responsibility either way. Um, so really what this is saying is that we're not quite there yet. We don't have killer vacuum cleaners. 
Um, you know, we don't have paper clips being made despite all of our, our, our complaints or whatever. But there's still a lot of issues and really big issues and issues that we ran into in 2012 um, and we saw in 2014 or we should have seen in 2014. One of the biggest ones, I think, is persuasion. Um, we obviously saw this in the 2016 election in the U.S., um, where people had weaponized Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, etc. And we're seeing an increase of this kind of weaponization across all of our social media, and it doesn't matter what country you're in or honestly what side you're on, um, we're seeing this. And there's a big difference between what was happening in 2012 in the U.S. in politics versus 2016. Um, and, and I think the easiest way to, to, to kind of talk about that difference is to talk about the rules that we followed in 2012, which were these. We made sure that when we were using data that we asked permission um, of the people whose data it was. Um, we also were transparent about how we were going to use that data. And then we gave attribution when we created a product based on that data. Um, I don't think that happened in 2016, and I don't think it's happening now. I think many of our social apps are not going through this, and they're actually just, as, just assuming things. Um, Tristan Harris, he talks a lot about this stuff, and I think it's interesting um, to follow him and what he's saying. Um, he has a great kind of um, paper or conversation around how, hi how technology hijacks people's minds. Specifically, he's talking about how we're all addicted to likes. We're addicted to getting emails. We're addicted to getting uh, retweets, to whatever that may be. It's an endorphin rush in our brains that is causing us to act and fall, uh, I guess, victim to these algorithms um, that are trying to get us to engage in content, look at ads, et cetera. And I don't think we'll survive if we are, if that is our adversary. And he talks a lot about how do we get out of that. I think the best person that talks about this stuff is Renee DiResta. She's one of my favorite people on this topic. And she talks specifically um, about radicalization via the recommendation engine. She talks about Facebook and Facebook groups and how you can have an empty group, and, or uh, sorry, an empty profile on Facebook with no signals, and you take that, that Facebook group, or that Facebook profile, sorry, and you join a new mother's group, which is an important group for many people. And then you just follow the recommendations that Facebook gives you. And like 10 Facebook group recommendations later, you're in a flat earther group. This doesn't seem good. Um, and she talks about why that is, and she's really doing a lot of work around disinformation. But the thing is, is that our recommendation engines themselves, these algorithms that are trying to give, make us have a better experience, are leading us, normal folks, down a path of radicalization. And there's a lot of bias. We hear a lot about bias around AI, bias around machine learning, and I think it's a huge problem and something that we can't talk about enough. Um, Kate Crawford calls this the white guy problem. Um, when you look like me, you look like San Francisco. You look like the people who are building these technologies. And we don't have diverse populations in that room. And so we run into things like this. Self-driving cars more likely to drive into black people. So I have another story around this kind of thing, and I, and, and I think it's really, it's, it's funny. This is obviously not funny. Um, so I was an advisor to this, to this great Chinese startup, computer vision startup. It did amazing things. Some of the best computer vision people I'd ever met. Um, and they had created this, this, just this library that was very good. Eventually, Amazon bought them, and they now run all of Amazon's computer vision at AWS. Um, cool stuff. So they had this time where they came in and showed us their product. And they, they brought in, they were like, this is really great. You're going to love it. I'm like, OK, what is it? They're like, it's a selfie camera that can guess your age. And I'm like, oh, cool, weird, but cool. So I, they take a selfie to demo it. There's six of them. They take a selfie. And each one of them, it the age is perfect, 26, 30, 24, you know, et cetera. And then I try it. I'm like, I'm, I'm so excited. So I take a, a selfie, 300 years old. <laughs> and I'm just like, well, it's a little off. <laughs> um, I'm not 300. They're like, oh, oh, I get it. You know, it's probably your beard and your glasses. Um, and so my friend Clint, who's sitting next to me, he's, he's like, well, I'll try it. He, he takes off his glasses, doesn't have a beard, takes it 120 years old. And they kind of huddle together, and they're just like, what could go wrong? Why did this happen? And then they realize they had not tested on anyone but Chinese people. <laughs> this is the thing. When we're, do, when we're building these solutions, we have to make sure that our context, our network, the people around us are the audience are the internet. We're here today to talk about the internet. The internet is very wide. It's not just someone like me. It's really hard. 
And training AI, I think, is one of the hardest things to do to remove that bias. So here's another, here's another uh, model. Um, in an artificial life simulation where survival required energy, but giving birth had no energy cost, one species evolved a sedentary lifestyle that consisted mostly of mating in order to produce new children which could be eaten. That doesn't sound very good. So I think AIs are interesting, and I think we, we talk a lot about training models, we talk a lot about bias, and I think the reason it's complicated is because it's a lot like the genie. Everyone remembers the genie story from when we were kids. You go, you rub a magic lamp, a magic lantern. I don't, where do you find these lanterns? It feels like there was a time when lanterns were everywhere and you rubbed them for some reason. Why did you even get into this problem? So you find a lantern, you rub it, a genie pops out and says, I can grant you three wishes. And you always, in the stories, there's always some elaborate wish that kills or hurts the person that wished for it. I would immediately say, I want really cool gold pants, and then I wouldn't be able to walk because they're made out of gold, or something along those lines. So we think about that all the time, and I think we are all equipped to not accept those wishes. Or maybe not, because I think AI is just like that genie, meaning, meaning that AI does exactly what we tell it. And I don't think we're prepared for that power. So one of my favorite people that talks about this stuff is this woman named Joy at, at, at MIT's Media Lab. Um, she's amazing, and she created this organization called the Algorithmic Justice League. The reason she created this organization, um, as you can tell, um, Joy is a normal black woman. So she was doing some, some programming tests, and you know, ha, uh, those of you who've programmed, you know when you're just banging your head against something and you just can't get it to work? I think that was her experience. And apparently, she was just doing this, this exercise around computer vision, and nothing worked. And she gave up, and she grabbed that mask, you can see that white mask, and she put it on, she was going to a party or something, and suddenly all of her computer vision stuff worked. Because as a black woman, the algorithms did not work on her. But when she wore a caricature of a white person, that white mask, they worked fine. This is an example of when the bias is in the algorithms. And so she created this organization called the Algorithmic Justice League to try and stop this. Um, and I think that's what we have to do, more of that. The third thing that we need to really be careful about is displacement and de-skilling. So in the US alone, there's 3.5 to 4 million truck drivers that are instantly going to be out of job within the next 10 years. But luckily, we're all in the same boat. Kai Fu Lee says that automation could replace 40% of jobs in 15 years. And I don't think any industry is safe. Except, is there anyone here who is safe? There's always one person. <laughs> so, wow, you guys are aware. There's always one person who's like, I'm safe, you know, and you're like, what do you do? And then uh, there's always some crazy person. Anyway, um, <laughs> so what do we do about this? Well, actually, I don't know, but I'm going to go, has anyone seen this movie? Glenn Gary, Glenn, Glenn I have never seen this movie. I have no idea what it's about. But we know that ABC is really important, right? ABC. Always be conscientious, right? That's what that movie says. Um, I think we have to make sure that we're always thinking of the people. And the best way to do this is to think about the users. Invest in user experience. How many people here are user experience professionals? Okay, how many people here have users? Isn't that weird? I think this is the funniest thing in the world. We all have users, that, yet we're like, nah, not me. I'm not going to talk to them. That's ridiculous. <laughs> we have to think of people, and we have to invest in ethics. So I graduated college in 2001, and ethics was not near computer science at all. Maybe in some, I don't know, hippie colleges or somewhere far away, ethics was there. But for me, it was never a conversation. There was never a conversation about ethics, about responsibility. I think it's so important that we bring ethics into technology from the executive level, but I think it's more important that we bring it in at the worker level. We need both sides to be able to push back so that we don't have a thing that happened to us in 2012 where we built really cool technology that was then used against us, that was then used against the world. Um, but there is one final thought that I have around this stuff, and that comes actually after listening to Gary Kasparov, who I really like um, kind of what he says around this stuff. He talks a lot about what it was like to be beaten just completely trounced by a big chess computer. And he talks about maybe what Lee Sedolf thought when he was going through that himself. But the important thing that he talks about is, as you're building these, these kind of competitions, when you have a chess computer paired with a human, it beats everyone. It beats the chess computers and it beats the humans. 
So the best results are when we pair AI with people. And I think that's the thing that I've learned, is it's really important to make sure that we don't outsource our humanity to the AI. But also, there's another thing that I think is really interesting, which is Lee Sedol, he's not lost since that match. He learned from what the, what the Go computer did and has iterated upon that. So I do have hope. Well, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to be here for the second time. I'm really happy to be here. And please follow me on Twitter. Thank you, Harper. Have a seat. So I like this new uh, goth Harper that travels the world in black clothing and tells us we all suck. Well, um, <laughs> I think it was always there. <laughs> it was or, just hidden. I mean, I mean, at least it started in high school. I, mean, I basically bought these clothes in high school. I'm just, wearing, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but so you, uh, last time you were here, you were super excited about using Facebook for fun and profit. And I was going to ask you, but then you gracefully brought it up in your own presentation, how do you feel about it now? But I guess my question now is going to be, if you think that you should have been more careful or we should have been more careful around this technology, what's stopping another bright-eyed, bushy-tailed Harper look-alike, you know, six years younger than you are now, from doing the same thing. Because this is, this is something that happens to us as we age, right? We, we mellow out and we go, oh, I shouldn't have done Not that. Not me. <laughs> yeah, I, I think, there's a, I think there's, a, a, there's, a, there's a thought exercise that I go through a lot, which is, if I was CTO in 2016, would I have done the same things that would happen in 2016? Because especially in these kind of environments, it's about, it's, it's about winning, it's about truth. And so yeah. oftentimes you're able to compromise your beliefs, your values, because you're going to win or you're going to be right. Um, and I worry about that a lot, which is why I think it's so important that we incorporate an idea of ethics within all levels of technology. And I, and I, I think it's important that we have chief ethics officers and all that, but I don't think that's going to be as effective as making sure that the workers themselves can, as, as we're seeing in Google, we're seeing this in Facebook, the workers themselves have a voice. And they can choose not to work on something. And they can say, no, I'm not going to work on that. I don't think we were equipped to have that conversation in 2012 from the bottom or the top. We were just trying to win. But if we would have had someone that said, hey, you know, this might not be, this might be a problem. Like, do we, do we really want to do this? Um, at least we could have had a conversation about it, whereas I, I don't think we did. Well, I, I, I know we didn't. You were just uh, excited by the possibilities and well, we blindly were, following the ideas. I don't think we were blindly following it. I think we were specifically following it to win. And so it's not so much blindly. We knew what we were doing. It was obviously what we were doing. There wasn't just, I mean, so the question that we had all the time was, is this creepy? But creepy is different. That's that's basically the question of, will we be caught? Will someone see through the facade and understand how we are using the data? So in some ways, we, we may have even known that there was a problem, but we were, we were trying to iterate into a place where we weren't going to be creepy. Um, and I remember very specifically this conversation of like, is this creepy? Um, we had this algorithm that you could run the Facebook data through and it would, it would choose a person's best friends in rank order. It was very successful. And, and there were a few times where we were like, yeah, this is creepy, like when it would choose an X or it choose someone you don't want to associate with. Um, but you have, but it, it, so we tweak it so it wouldn't do that. And we say, okay, now it's not creepy. Um, but when I say it, we can choose your best, through your data, we can choose your best friend in rank order. That sounds kind of creepy. But you talked then about that there was this um, culture of asking of permission, even if even if it might have been creepy, there, there was still the sense that you would ask yeah. for it, and, and then that later disappeared. Uh, why do you think that is? Um, I'm not sure, but I do know that in 2013, I was in Germany talking to this German um, reporter, and, and she was grilling me on our use of data. And she was saying, um, you know, maybe you should have been more careful about your use of data. And I said, but you're sitting here on Facebook. Like, she was on Facebook while we were chatting. And I think there's this thing that happened, which is we all gave up some of our data for the convenience of being connected with our friends. And, and, and I, I mean, they, a lot of people say, oh, now you're the product, all that stuff. I, oh, sure, maybe. But I think what it was is I think a lot of people were more conscious of it than, than it's a little awkward, where I think we knew we were trading data for convenience. Like, I want to be able to see my friends' photos on Instagram 
So I'm okay with them taking my data for that process, which I think we do every day. I think we make that decision every day. Um, but I think the, yeah, I don't know. I don't even, I don't even remember the question you asked, sorry. <laughs> do you I really? was like, wait a minute, where am I? <laughs> do you really think that's actually a conscious de decision that people make? Yes, I'm willingly giving up my data. Do you think the average user is aware of what they're giving up to get connected? I actually don't know. I think that's a good question for Dana. Yeah. <laughs> so when you were doing this work for Obama, you were working for the good side. Yep. And then a, the evil side, the evil empire, came with their lightsabers and everything. And they, no, they don't have lightsabers with their... Well, they're, they're a different color. They're yeah, red. yeah, right, yeah. the red ones. Yeah. Uh, they came and they did this evil. How can we... I mean, do you think the responsibility then lies most heavily on the tech giants like Facebook and Google to protect us from the evildoers of the world? Because there's always going to be evil in the world and there's always going to be people using algorithms and data for bad. I think it's actually way more complicated than that because I know if you had Brad Pascal on this couch, he would just have a completely opposite interaction, right? He, would, he was a CTO for Trump's campaign in 2016 and he's now the campaign manager in 2020. Um, and he, I think he would say, you know, the red... Um, the red lightsabers were on the Obama team, were mm. on the Hillary team. And so that's what actually it makes this very complicated, is there are sides, um, and one, you know, from my perspective, does seem a little evil, and from it seems anyone outside the U.S.'s perspective maybe also evil, but um, it's not as clear-cut as they're bad and we're good. Um, and so that makes it more complicated to figure out. But I do think that a lot of these companies, um, I'll just say all <laughs> of these companies, um, are very interested in profits, in ad clicks, over what is right. Um, you see this on YouTube all the time, like there was just a, a report that said there's 50 or so state-sponsored um, like kind of news channels on YouTube that are not marked as such. And YouTube's like, oh, I didn't notice. Mm. And it's <laughs> like, if if a researcher on the outside of Google can find this information, I'm sure a researcher on the inside of Google would have an easier time. Um, and I think that a lot of cases, these companies are doing this willing, willingly, where they, they don't want to give up the ad profit. But do you think they are actively not looking? Or yes. do you th yeah, so they, they're like, la, 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 we, we're not going to look for the bad stuff. I think they are, I think they know. Like, for instance, I think Twitter, I think Twitter's getting better, but I think Twitter for a long time, knew that if they solved uh, harassment and they solved the abuse, that they would decrease the active users on their platform, which would decrease their stock price. That sounds like very, very evil. Well, I think it just, it just shows that in the, in the world that we're in, it's easy to get into a place where you start a company for good reasons, you get into, you make it, go, it goes public, and then you realize that you have to prop it up with, with maybe metrics that aren't necessarily of value, like active users. Like, is that really bringing value? And I think that this is, I mean, I think the roots of this are in capitalism more so than they are in bad startups or people are just trying to make money. And uh, yeah, it's complicated. So the next thing that I think is going to happen is that now the heavy acts of regulation is going to come down like the hammer of God on all of these companies as soon as, probably at least as soon as the Democrats win back power. Well, luckily it'll be written by old white people that don't understand tech. Yes, that's always a good thing. Yeah, yeah because they make the best decisions regarding tech. Yeah, they tech. really do. They're yeah. really thinking of everyone. No, but isn't it... <laughs> does... Good point, yeah. <laughs> Doesn't it seem inevitable now that Facebook will be broken up like the monopoly it is, that Google I, will be broken up, that Alphabet will have to divest some of its... So, I have no idea, but I think that Google made Alphabet as a first step to be broken right. up. I yeah. think they're the only ones that saw the future and are like, well, we're going to be broken up, let's, let's, let's start doing it already so it's easy. Um, I don't know. And, and I, I worry that the U.S., like, I don't think GDPR is bad. Um, I think it's complicated, and, and I hate those cookie pop-ups. I don't know how y'all live with this world. Um, <laughs> There's a plug-in for that. Oh, is it? Okay, yeah. that might be helpful. Yeah. Um, but I think that's better. It's also a start, and it's a conversation where you go to a, I went to a salon right after GDPR passed in, in London, and they had a thing about GDPR. They were like, you know, if you sign your email to this paper email list, you have to, you know, I was just like, wow, even the salon owner has to know about this. Mm. So I, I think that's good because people are, are having a conversation around privacy and data, whereas in the U.S., there's none. And I think the reason or not, the people who need to have it are not big tech. 
I think it's the everyday users, the people in the salons. Um, and so in that regard, I think it's really good. The cookie thing, yeah, we've got to figure that out. Mm. Um, <laughs> but I do worry that because the lawmakers and regulators are old and typically white, that they don't know about tech. They're also smart, so they know they don't know, mm. which means they're going to ask for help. And I think the first person that's going to raise their hand are the lobbyists. Mm. And so that means that they're going to outsource their tech knowledge to people who have a very strong interest that they are fighting for. And I'm guessing that that will mean that very little will actually change. It'll just make it really annoying for anyone who's trying to get started. So final question. Uh, for anybody in this room now who's afraid of being killed by the Roomba after Yeah, you got to watch out. Yeah. What do you think is, like, that seems like something that is so far away from us as users. What can we do when we, I mean, once the algorithms and the robots are that smart to kill us to make more paper clips, yeah. isn't it too late? I mean, what yeah. do we do, what do, what do people in this do, room do now to, to not get killed by Roombas in the future? That's a very good question. I, I have to, yeah, you have to give me credit on that oh, one. Oh, man. Yeah. So, I'm going to answer a different question. <laughs> um, I actually think that there's a, a related thing here, which is, um, I don't think that the robots are going to kill us when it comes to Roombas, etc. I think what we're going to have is we're going to have two worlds. People who can afford automation, like driving a Tesla or a self-driving car, the new fancy Volvos, etc. Mm. And the people who cannot. And so suddenly safety, not getting killed by the robots, becomes a, a, a luxury item. And that's something I worry about quite a bit, that we're creating this technology. And I remember when I first saw the internet and the magic that there was. There's this thing of, like, how many people here remember when they first saw a web browser? And how you saw that web browser, and for me, it was a portal that had unlimited potential. I wish I would have seen Amazon.com. I would be very wealthy, mm. but I did not. Um, I saw really ridiculous websites to search for wares or whatever. Um, but there's this thing of, I saw unlimited potential. Um, and, and I think, I completely forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> the question is, how can we now not do, take small steps to, to ensure a future in which yes, we do not yes. get killed by well, robots? Well, I think there's this, this thing of, of, of that unlimited potential is still there, except now we're building things only for people who can't afford them, and we're not distributing it everywhere. Where I grew up, it wasn't a bunch of rich people. It was just people who were able to access the internet through a library and our school. Yeah. Everyone could do it. Now, for you to have access to the coolest AI that's going to save your life maybe when you're driving, you have to be a wealthy person. Mm. That scares me. And it scares me that we as entrepreneurs are not building for everyone. We're building for the few. Um, and, and, and I think that is will what lead us to a world where the robots will kill us. Non-distributed technology. Non-distributed, unequally distributed. Yeah. So Thank you. We, oh, sorry. sorry yeah. I just want to end on a hopeful note. Oh. How do we work towards that? How can we work more with ethics, and how can we work? Well, I actually think, uh, I don't know. I think, <laughs> so hopeful. Well, yeah, you know, I'm really hopeful. That's part of the, maybe I'm in mourning. Um, I think the first thing we have to do is we have to find the leaders um, who are listening. And I think there's a lot of people who are saying, there's actually this great article from this VC who invested in Facebook and Amazon, et cetera, uh, Roger McNamee or something like that, mm -hmm. who, who wrote a book called Zucked. Um, and uh, this friend of mine, Anil Dash, retweeted this guy and said, it's great that Silicon Valley is listening to one of their own, but what would it be like if they happened to listen to all the people who weren't rich that said this before the rich person said it? Mm. All the people who happen to not be white men who said it before. All the women, all the people of color who said it before. Like, why does it have to have, you know, Roger, a white man who's very wealthy, say it for everyone to listen? Or why do I have to be on stage here in Sweden to say it and have it, someone listen? Hopefully mm. you're listening. Um, but I think that's the thing is there's a lot of people who've been saying this before, but we did not listen. I'm not the first person to, to like, make the connection between Obama, and, uh, Obama tech stuff before. And, and, and and there's lots of people who made it in the early 2000s. But for whatever reason, we are just like, fuck yeah, money. <laughs> and I think that's why. I think it's probably capitalism. So we should start listening. Yes, let's start listening. Thank you so much, Thank Harper, you. for giving us an inspiring talk. And I don't know about that hope, but <laughs> we know we have to do something. <laughs>